Okay, well, thanks everybody for uh, joining us today. Um, today, we're gonna be talking about systems and their parts and their holes. Um, I'm Matt Chadsey, I'm one of the hosts here at Systems Thinking Daily, uh, facilitator for eCornell for Systems Thinking, and also do uh, this kind of work every day, helping communities um, use nature to adapt to climate change in my consulting work. So I'm pretty excited. This is the third of the um, sessions we've had to dive into the research that Derek and Laura have done. And it's really a, a unique opportunity to get a chance to uh, go through some of the details in the research and, and ask questions and really dig in and figure out how we can best um, apply it to our own work. Uh, obviously, Derek and Laura don't need a ton of introduction, but just to say for those of you who are new, uh, they both teach systems thinking, modeling, and leadership at Cornell, uh, are sought after both consultants and, and speakers on uh, systems and uh, uh, understanding complex systems around the world and lead the Cabrera Research Lab uh, with the goal of nine, uh, sorry, seven billion, sorry, we're not at nine yet, uh, seven billion systems thinkers. Um, and also a special thanks to Alina, who's online today for all the work she does, both to get this event together and to uh, keep the Systems Thinking Daily running smoothly every day. Today, I would, um, so uh, just the logistics for how we're going to go through today. The first, Derek and Laura are going to talk a little bit about a paper published earlier this spring called Systems organize information in mind and nature, empirical findings of part whole systems and cognitive and material complexity. So uh, there's a link to the paper that I posted last evening on Systems Thinking Daily. It's, it's a pretty interesting uh, read if you wanna go into the details, if you haven't already. Um, they'll present a little bit of background on the research and, and the findings, and then we'll spend the remainder of the time asking questions and digging into any topics that you guys find uh, interesting or uh, have questions about. We, uh, if you have questions as we go, please drop them into the Zoom chat, and we'll do the best to incorporate them uh, throughout the discussion. And please, if you're new to these, uh, don't be shy. There's no, there's no uh, in systems thinking, there's no bad questions. So. Uh, just throw anything in there and I'm sure somebody else uh, probably has the same question or would, would learn from the answer as well. So uh, please jump in. Um, as you know, we're recording this session and the recordings from the last two sessions that we did are now posted uh, in the, uh, on the network. So feel free to go and look at those if you, if you missed them and put on your calendar on the 29th. So this is, is it a blue moon when there's two uh, moons in one month there, there will be uh, two research sessions this month. So on the 29th, uh, we'll talk about understanding action, reaction, and relationships. So um, so that's a, a really interesting and you know probably maybe one of the more complex parts of the SRP is really digging into how the relationships work. So uh, please put that on your calendar if, you, uh, if you'd like to join us. So with that, um, Derek and Laura, dive in. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Matt, as always. Um... This is part three, part yeah. of systems. We're excited to do it. Yeah, it's a great thing that Matt has uh, been encouraging and, and leading is, uh, is making not just DSRP accessible, but, but having these sessions to try to make the research a little more accessible uh, <laughs> because I believe us, we know that the uh, reading through the papers can be uh, <laughs> somewhat daunting. They're a little bit like dense, so hopefully we'll kind of dispel any of that density uh, in this session. Yes. Um, so today, like like Matt said, we're going to talk about systems part whole, uh, which is a universal cognitive pattern. It's basal to a ton of stuff like, uh, you know, sets and sorts and sorting and grouping and permutations and combinatorics and mathematics and clusters and network theory. Those are all essentially synonyms there's a, there's a that picture there is all the synonyms of uh what we mean when we talk about part whole systems and um really uh part whole systems are are you know the studies what we focused on is that um is is empirically testing part whole uh and and there are a ton of different implications about how part whole systems form 
what are their internal dynamics uh, and external dynamics, the role that part whole systems play in individual, but also social cognition. Like when we're thinking as groups like science, the whole of science is sort of uh, social cognition or when we're navigating you know, our political constructs and uh, as a nation or whatever. Uh, so that's, we, we actually have cognition in groups and also as individuals. Um, and the role part whole plays in metacognition, which is critically important, and the effects of metacognitive awareness of part whole on your thinking. So there's seven studies that we're going to hit on or highlight that are in the paper. Um, and you'll notice that um, in parallel to the other studies that we've done, these studies really confirm the co-implication, the interchangeability, and the sort of way that part and whole are inextric inextricably linked to each other, much like we'll see in the other patterns and the other research that we've done. And it might seem really simple because it's, you know, part whole. You just go, oh, well, that's really simple, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but it actually gets pretty, pretty remarkable, like how such a simple concept can have so many implications and you don't have to really understand all this list of bullets, but um, you know every whole can be a part, and every part can be a whole. And the, the there's a special relationship between holes and parts. You know, parts uh, belong to holes, and holes contain parts. And um, and uh, the whole. You, you actually need a, a distinction, DIO, to, to make a part-whole system. You need, you need relationships to make a part-whole system. You need perspective to make a part-whole system. So you can't actually create, a, a sort things or group things without the other patterns. So we talk about the dependencies. And in these studies, we actually studied the dependencies um, on D and R and P as well. Um, the whole is actually also in the part, uh, which is really kind of deep and, and is the basis for like statistics and um, probability and fuzzy logic and things like that. So it's pretty, pretty deep. I mean, you know, two whole areas of mathematics are permutations and combinatorics. And that's all based on uh, the, the sort of order of parts and the configuration of parts. Um, so part whole, if I, if, if I could impress upon one thing upon you, it's that um, don't underestimate this little guy called part mm -hmm. whole because he or she or it is, uh, is like this really truly amazing and, and simple concept that has a wilderness of complexity inside of it and is really fascinating just to study in a, on its own you know without all the other the other all of its friends so but I also think because of because it's so seemingly obvious and seemingly simple in the entire world around us you know like we see part whole systems very easily unlike relationships are sometimes hidden yeah I think that people uh underestimate the profound meaning of how things are organized into part whole systems. And I think that's what some of the, the studies we did actually show, the sort of underlying implications of thinking about part whole more deeply and differently than we would on the surface. And if you ever want to, um, you know, consider just how powerful the simple idea is, just think about gerrymandering. Mm -hmm. And the the reorganization of political boundaries, right? Which all parties do, um, but I mean, it seems like such a simple thing, but it can affect whole elections. It can affect who gets elected, the composition of you know the leaders of a country, um, and all of that is just the manipulation of part whole. Sure. Uh, so pretty simple concept with you know. Massive, massive implications, uh, implications and that we things like that. Day. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Yeah. And then if you remember also, we will sort of run through each of these for a few minutes and then talk about them more deeply. If you remember the fish tank study, uh, part whole was part of that. And, you know, there was a very brief treatment in part whole to bring people awareness of the rule. 
and we found, you know, with high statistical significance that um, just a short exposure to the, the idea of part whole helped people see more in that fish tank, have more complexity around the things they saw, saw groupings differently and all kinds of things. So I just wanted to sort of hang back into that research. And this study had really powerful results. Uh, and and if if I was to summarize, you know, all of it, because it it's another paper in, in its own right, um, all it's saying really empirically uh, with, again, statistically highly significant results is that knowing about SPW, systems part whole, increases cognitive complexity, robustness, and systems thinking. So just being aware that part whole is like a universal pattern of cognition and using it purposefully, metacognitively, being aware of it when you're using it um, makes you a better thinker. That's that's what this, this study says empirically. Um, and that's, we call that, effectiveness studies. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the effect of knowing part whole, which is different than does part whole exist in cognition and that type of stuff. Um, there's also in this paper uh, references uh, a number of studies that were collected over a, 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 a literature review across many disciplines. So you can see a lot of different disciplines here. And we see part whole across all of them. And, and uh, you know, you could just keep collecting and collecting and collecting all the studies that hit on part whole. Um, but these, this is one lit review of, of part whole across the disciplines. So it's something that exists in, in you know, all the different disciplines of knowledge, um, that I'm type sure. of thing. And, you know, if you remember, uh, we have done a a very large sample of over, almost 35,000 people where we've broken down, um, you know, when given the opportunity to think through something, what do, what do people do? I don't know if I'm gonna say remarkably or shockingly, 48% um, of people sort of froze up. Of the 52% of people who did not freeze up, you'll see that about half of them actually uh, broke something down into its parts meaning it's um, something they do, but not with great frequency. And so it's not, you know, at the bottom of the list and it's not at the top, but it's still something where we have a lot of area for growth and improvement in that sense. So people, you know, on the, on, you know, from the get-go, they know to sort of distinguish things or think about a thing, but they don't always think about its constituent parts and breaking it down to another level of scale when they're thinking about things. And that ties in with, yeah, I mean, just to just to put a punctuation on that, that's one in four people. Yeah. So one in four people, when they're asked to think about something, actually break things down into parts. <laughs> right. So again, like if you just have this awareness, yeah, boy, like super easy to just be like, oh, okay, what what can we break down into parts? One in four is what that data says that's because right. it's half of the total and then half of that total. It's kind of frightening to put it that way. Yeah. That was a punctuation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like we should make, we need a big like emoji for the punctuation. Punctuations. Um, remember also we were able to identify strengths and weaknesses across the patterns through this research. And um, in particular, uh, even though 25 or one, 25% or one in four people do break things into parts, that's, you know, obviously a minority, but when they do that, there are three things they tend not to do. Uh, even in that act. So they don't really challenge the way or alternative ways that part whole systems are organized into a whole grouping. They very rarely think uh, across levels of scale, you know, up one or down one when they're thinking about part whole. And, you know, they also, even if they do get to the point of breaking things into parts, they very rarely think about what are the relationships between those parts you know, the parts of a whole, which we know when we're understanding the kinds of systems we're all thinking about, that's a critical piece of analysis and of understanding a system itself. We it's call those part that. parties, if you remember. Oh, yeah. Yeah, parties. parts like to relate. So we know what people don't do, which means we know the skills we need to develop. We know the things that we need to think about um, in terms of strengthening our ability in part whole systems. And of course, we find the same pattern, uh, the Dunning-Kruger effect with part-whole systems. Uh, people are 
uh, more confident than they are competent in utilizing them. Um, and also you'll notice part whole scores, competency scores uh, are the, the lowest of the D, S, R, and P. Yeah. But yet we think we can do it really well. So there's a, there's a lot of things that come out of these studies um, and, and we can hit on them throughout the, the questions and the answers and things like that. But generally speaking, what these what these different what we call an ecology of studies, because it's a bunch of different studies, uh, part whole systems, what it gets at is that they're universal. They exist in both the mind, but also in nature itself. Um, awareness is good for you. Awareness of part whole is good for you. It decreases bias, increases cognitive complexity. Um, it the, the the results of this study really challenge the age old uh dominance of category theory uh that there are that there are kind of natural categories there aren't there's part whole sorts by perspective mm -hmm. right so we take a different perspective we get a different part whole sort and that's a that's a big deal like i guess you would say academically that's that might not seem like a big deal in in the applied world that you're getting rid of a theory but uh it is it's a, a kind deal. of a big deal um also, that part whole is totally dependent on the other three rules, which was a hypothesis that now is empirically tested and, and uh, turns out to be the case. Um, and that the other three rules are dependent on part whole. So um, people group stuff very differently. Um, but despite those differences, they also have patterns of sameness which is interesting. Um, we can we can get better at it is another finding, uh, which which a lot of people kind of are, you know, there's there's a lot of folks that that make the claim that, you know, you're kind of born a good thinker or not, you know, uh, but that's just not the case. We can we can learn, we can teach it, we can get better at it. There's very specific things that we can teach that will get you better at it. Um, Sure. And finally, that we're kind of overconfident, which we talked about. So all of those things are uh, um, part and parcel. Sort of the aggregate of the no bias, pun intended. Oh, God. <laughs> How do you think of these part whole? Part and parcel. You are the funny one. That's part whole, right? Part and it. parcel. You are the funny yeah. one in the house. Um, anyway, you'll see that these findings are are um, sort of across the seven studies. You know, we have seven different studies about sorting stuff and things like that. Um, are we going to highlight them a little bit? Or yeah, is that wanna, what we're doing? Should we run through some of the studies or do you want to? Uh, yeah, why don't you go through quickly uh, a couple of them? At, least, uh, at least a few of them and then we can yep. get into some questions. And folks, if you have questions, drop them in the chat as well as a reminder. We'll just give you a quick, quick uh, review of like what the actual studies were, so that you can kind of get a, gra a grasp on what what we did because they're not as complex as they seem. Uh, this was a, a question you can kind of fill in what you think your answer would be. Um, this is kind of a question that you would typically find on a on an IQ type test, um, and what we see here is that we get lots of different answers. Uh, one answer in particular comes out you know, as a, a pretty significant majority. And notice that even though uh, the part whole and relationships are unconscious uh, or implicit in the person's searching for the answer, um, they do have to sort into groupings and relate the parts in order to um, get the answer. Right. And so this is how we establish, you know, these dependencies like uh, the dependency on R, for example. But what's interesting about that is you can look at that and instantly know the answer, but you don't take the moment to realize why you know the answer or how you know the answer, which is yeah. which is interesting that when we bring that into con people's consciousness, that means then they can have much more fluidity with other things as they come up. Right? And it means and these, these, things. these things are really basal to logic and reasoning and you know problem solving and those kinds of things. Here's a good one. Another study that we did was uh, this question. So you can take a moment to see how you would answer it. Um, and then you'll see, we'll give you how other people answered it. We called this the not red circle study. That's our great name. <laughs> <laughs> and this is how people answered it, which uh, 
much different than the last one. Uh, uh, the, the last one, 88% of the people answered it uh, very similarly. This one, a lot of, lot of diversity, a lot of difference across them. And you sort of ask yourself, well, what's the right answer, right? Because we, we tend to think in, in school that there's a right answer to, you know, uh, to the way we design things. It turns out that there really is a rationale for all of the answers, um, except for maybe one. Um, and that is that it, you can see that the, the way that people answered is based on whether they chose the relationship between circleness and redness. So if we say the answer is not red circle, that, that could be interpreted differently as the answer is not circle or redness or not circle and redness. And depending on that relationship that they make, then different answers would be quite rational and logical and you know defensible. Um, and so again, we see that depends on your perspective, depends on the relationship. Uh, there's dependencies in the way that we organize things into part whole systems. Um, and again, part whole is part of our cognitive process, even when we don't know it. Yeah. And so knowing it uh, increases our effectiveness. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Also, I think this calls into question, you know, the way we think about uh, testing where, where there could be yeah. multiple answers to things uh, and that, for example, students might have a rationale for an answer that we don't agree with or that we don't even see, but is actually just as rational as the answer that we designed the test for. For sure. For and sure. and sometimes more innovative, you know. <laughs> why why is a red circle a possible answer? That That made me confused when I was taking this. Yeah, red circle is the one that uh, that you know, it's unclear what those five point five percent were thinking, right? Like yeah, it's, it's maybe they had some rationale or maybe they didn't read the knot or something like that. I mean, there might be some rationale, but we don't know uh, from the research. We don't know what why that five point five percent answered red circle. Mm -hmm. But they did. But they did. <laughs> Sometimes we we put those in as a, a way to know if people are actually reading. Yeah. They put in these sort of red yeah. herring kind of things. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. that, I don't know if that was the case, but <clears throat> anyway. You could do a follow-up study and, and with those, if somebody answers red circle, you could ask them why they answered red circle yeah, and you might find out they misread the question or... Or mm -hmm. they're like the rebels of life. Yeah, they exactly. just, if you say not, they say yes, you know, who knows? And then this is the uh, world famous sort stuff study, <laughs> right? Where um, participants were given a wide range of objects and asked to um, make their own groupings and name those groupings. So there was no grouping made for them and there was no name gave, given to the, new, the way they sorted it. So it's sort of a free form thing to see how they would group them. There were 320 people grouping these um, six items. And what's interesting is across those items, they came up with 243 unique groups and named them, right? And if you think about, <clears throat> it's pretty remarkable, right? That that six items, six items came up with that many unique uh, categories. And, and what you'll see is uh, writing tools, office school supplies, cleaning and household and how people sorted them all differently and named them differently, uh, which means that we are, um, when you don't pre-establish the category for people, they will come up with it for themselves or the name or the, or the grouping. And that, um, that they can be grouped into a, a whole bunch of different things and that these, those items are not inherently part of a category, meaning we, we think of that category. It comes from us according to how we relate them, right? So that gets back to the, inter, you know, the interactivity between the patterns and also that there are based on our perspective, right? What we're thinking about. So to sort of summarize, or uh, just to put an exclamation point on this, because sometimes it, it, it gets real confusing. What this study is saying is that you give a bunch of people that are generalizable to the United States, six things, and you get 
243 unique groupings. <laughs> okay, that's number one. So, wow, that's a lot of diverse groupings from six things, right? Now, if we look at patterns in those groupings, we can reduce those to similar types of groups, even though the names were different and all that. So that has a lot to do with how we distinguish things and they're sort of similar, but they're not exact. But we see patterns and we can see these five different patterns coming out, five different grouped patterns. Yep. So what that means is we think really differently, but at the same time, we kind of think somewhat similarly which is interesting in and of itself yeah. um, with yeah. part whole groupings. And then if you can, if you contrast it to the next one, which is the sort button study, also another world famous study, um, we gave people uh, three distinct groupings. In, in other words, we named them and we said, sort these buttons from the perspective of color, from the perspective of size, and from the perspective of the number of holes. So we we gave them an existing set of, of groupings. And what we found is that people are really good at doing that, right? That they, by and large, the majority of them very successfully sorted them by those three perspectives, right? And, and what's interesting is you contrast that to the sort stuff and the sort buttons. What you're seeing is the difference between, yes, we can sort things uniquely when we're not given a predetermined perspective from which to sort them from. But also we're really good at, if somebody hands you a framing or a perspective or a category, you're able to put stuff into it, right? So that's two ways that part whole systems are formed, you know, either uniquely from us or given to us. And what we wanna do is challenge it in particular when those categories are given to us, because that's coming from somebody else's perspective or frame or agenda, or whatever it is um, that you can assign to that. And there's there's really useful information here in terms of our practices, right? So if you want a group to really be creative, as Scott just asked in the chat, um, does this have to do with creativity? If you want them to be creative, don't inhibit with perspective, right? Just, yep. just say, sort them any way you want to sort them, and you're going to get lots of creativity, literally creation. But if you want to get a group that's like unruly to kind of focus, then consider giving them some structural help about what the holes are. So either way, you're going to have holes and parts, yep. but you can you can kind of do divergent thinking or convergent thinking based on on the perspective that you use uh, in the whole function. Does that yep. make some sense? Yeah. And what's interesting is, oh. So no. I was thinking when we were talking about like relationships and perspectives in, in the case of um, the first study, the sort stuff, it's the relationships that people make uniquely across the items that lead to the groupings, right? And then in the second one, the sort buttons, it's the relationship that's already been made, right? For you that leads to the groupings. And so when we talk about those interchangeability or interaction between them, I just, I don't Super know. Super dependent. I know it seems silly at sort buns, but it's really interesting. It's it, fascinating. It tells you a lot of interesting things, but I guess we should. To your question, Scott, about the participants, um, the these all of these studies we're talking about are all generalizable to the U.S. population uh, minus children, because we didn't want to uh, have children in the, in the study. But um, this one had 400 and yeah, it's, it's, 100 some people. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I guess my question was, you had 240 some differences. And it sounds like that was about basically half of the number of participants. So it's 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 like you had 400 some participants and you ended up with 250 groupings. So it's almost, I mean, for my brain, I'm thinking that's almost one to one, basically, because I wouldn't expect that at all. Yeah. Like every person did it differently. Different. I mean, granted, yeah. it was like every other person, but still that's Oh. Yeah, it's mind blowing. And at the same time, there were similarities to the way people did things. If you look underneath, which actually talks a little, gives you a little insight into how difficult distinctions can be, right? Because we might be distinguishing things differently, but underneath, where the our mental construct is very similar, right? So you might call cleaning tools cleaning tools, and I might call them 
uh, household tools or something like that. And we might think we're talking about different things because we're using different language. Uh, or you can imagine the problem of AI trying to sort out, yeah. you know, that that those two people are talking about the same things and have roughly the same mental construct, but um, are using very different distinction labels and things like that. Yeah. Eric, would you say it seems like there's a varying grade of sort of cultural norms in terms of how people sort things, right? So if I put knives and forks and spoons on the table, my guess yeah. is that everybody would kind of sort them like like everybody does naturally, because that's how we do it. Or, you know, at least it's very common to put the knives together and the spoons together, or whatever. Yep. Um, versus like the list of your cleaning and tool supplies and things. You know, people don't think about that, so there's no norm. It's, it seems sort of interesting to think about for each topic, or if you're working through a topic at work, sort of like what the norm is, and then how much diversity people come up with outside of that. Does that make sense? Yeah, right? absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. And, and that, that, that question actually challenges also the notion of sort of um, natural kinds and categories in, um, in cognitive theory, which, you know, has, has been a, a kind of a, a pillar of, of cognitive theory for a long time. And, um, you know, if you weren't exposed to forks and knives and spoons all the time, then you might group them quite differently. You might say, mm -hmm. well, this is more of a rounded thing and this is these are pointy things mm -hmm. and you wouldn't necessarily group them the way that we group them because we've been socialized to group them that yeah. way. So. Mm -hmm. so Matt, I think we have like 10 minutes or so, yeah, for your, um, your Q&A part. So yeah, well, we, I mean, we're, uh, do you have more? Uh, I mean, I have a few questions. I mean, one that I had, which was just interesting, and then Scott, I see your hand, I'll, I'll uh, get to you in a second. Um, the sorting buttons by size, people seem to really struggle with, which I thought was interesting because there was like 30% or so uh, put the big buttons in the medium box and, and so forth. So I thought that was, you know, that was pretty different. The one with holes was like, you know, 95% or whatever. And I, I was wondering if you had any insight about why that seemingly pretty simple challenge? I mean, it's visually pretty obvious from the from the pictures in the study, you know, how they should, what the sizes are, and if you have any insight into why that happened in that particular case. Yeah, to, uh, I think it actually is a distinction thing. It has to do with contrast. Mm -hmm. So the more, like the darker the color, the more the contrast, the larger something looks. So mm -hmm. even a, like a medium blue will look larger than a uh, light green uh, mm -hmm. medium. And, and so people just literally had more difficulty distinguishing between sizes, I think. I mean, we don't know that from mm -hmm. the study, but that would be my guess. And do you uh, control for like colorblindness and things like that? It's interesting that using red and green, because I was thinking, I was looking up actually, you know, something like 4% of the population is red green color blind which uh was similar to some of the results on the ones that were you know like 95 percent or so i was wondering if that is a factor you've thought about that we have thought about that I, we didn't control for color blindness because because in a sense the the whole the holes question controls for that because because uh uh you know there's you don't have to rely on color to to mm -hmm. sort those right, right. Mm -hmm. okay uh, Scott, you had a question, I think. Yeah, so distinction alignment, you know, I, one of the things I'd heard before was this idea of we're picturing the same concept, but using a different word, mm -hmm. or we're picturing the same concept, but we're using, oh wait, or picturing a different concept, but using the same word. Yeah. Right. So what I'm seeing in this results just is that the picturing using different words seems to be the results that you're showing. Yes. All right. So this idea of picturing something different, but using the same word doesn't seem to have been as a big part because it's like half of the of your results, more or less, were the similar same word. If you're saying that there's 250 or so different ones out of 400 and some people. I'm just wondering if that's something that 
you think has any significance to it because it seems like they're more about using different words to describe these groups or maybe it's just the different way the groups were put together i think with the, with these um the simplicity of these of this study uh for example if we go back to uh you know this these things because these are so simple what's going to differ more is going to be the way the words we use to describe the groupings now if you took slightly more complex things like you know empathy and resilience or you know social constructs that are that are quite much more less tangible i think you would get different constructs of those things not just different terminology so but what i'm most oh, I'm sorry. That. but we did we didn't test for that that but but that would certainly be an interesting study it it seems like the data is already there because if you how many people use the same name to describe the grouping not and not very many not many right yeah. and so it seems like out of those two options I'm thinking the same thing, I'm using a different word, or I'm thinking something different, but I'm using the same word. It doesn't seem like using the same word is something that was part of the results you found. Uh, no, well, we have that data. Uh, we I just didn't, we didn't really focus as much on that. Um, right, you mean how we collapsed. But what we, what we did do was we sort of said through a process called inner rate of reliability, we we looked at the data and said, you know, if if this person is talking about writing utensils, it could be like desk things or writing or um, drawing supplies or you know they're 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 grouping it as writing, We've, right? Yeah. So we gave that category or that part whole grouping the term writing or tools or office supplies or things like that. They were coded, yeah. Sure. Yeah, right. Uh, we have a new guest here, a, a little person with Ryan. Um, the <laughs> um, Ryan asked a good question. You yeah, answered a little bit, but I think it might be worth uh, a little more discussion. Is just you know the difference between sort of material sorting and and uh, cognitive, you know, bigger ideas like you know, like you said, resilience or or something like that. Like how are there any? If we're working on those bigger problems, what are thoughts about how to you know, work with a group to come up with um, groupings and kind of break things into parts and holes. You have just either from like consulting experience or, you know, from the studies, ways to think about better managing those broader, less defined areas. Okay. So <laughs> wait, I make sure I understand the question. So you're saying when you are working with things that are, are more squishy, less object oriented, mm -hmm. you have to sort them What's the process by which you would get people to a similarity of meaning, a meaning, a meaningful similarity or a shared mental model? Yeah, how to get something usable? Because people, again, people are going to have different words for the same thing, different, you know, same words for different things, and sort of what's a process for getting some well, sort of continuity around it? Yeah, ir ironically, truly, ironically, the way that we know that whether whether kind of what scott said which is like is are we using the same word with different constructs or different constructs with the same word um the way we know that is part whole because we'll never be able to sort of tell on the surface of the distinction right you have to we have to go in and and if as an example if you know matt you, you say you call it x and i call it y well we we could just disagree all day on, on x and y but if if your X has the very same parts that my Y has, then we can start to say, well, this is just semantic, mm -hmm. right? Because, because the structure of Matt's construct and the structure of my construct are literally the same except for the name. Mm -hmm. And so we, what we wanna do is find out, is it is it just a semantic disagreement or is it a legitimate like structural disagreement? And part whole is the way we do that. We have to kind of zoom into the part whole of it and say, well, if our if our constructs are exactly the same, then it really is semantic. Mm -hmm. uh, there really isn't a difference between our our thinking on it. 
Right. So what 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 that really means, practically speaking, and I know we've done this in groups, is when you hear that kind of discrepancy, you've got to take people down to another level to really mm -hmm. see, you know, Ryan, like, are they in, are they structurally the same? Are they structurally different? And figure out, is it same thing, different word, different word, same thing, and just make that part of the conversation. And, you know, I will say when you do that, just resolving those kinds of distinction errors open up the rest of the dialogue and the rest of the clarity around whatever it is they're trying to understand. Because I think distinction errors are a huge part of- Absolutely. I mean, I think they come up a lot in, in our work that people that, are- that's great. Yeah, I mean, that's a very tactical thing that gets big results. I mean, it's very easy to just say, you know, what are the five parts of whatever that you have in mind of cleaning supplies or something like that and compare, That's that's great. Could you talk about, I mean, the other that I think is even less commonly done and to me even more powerful is the plus one, like what's, what are you a part of? Um, and that, that can really kind of expand, like if you look at a bicycle, it could be part of the recreation industry or fitness or metal things, or, you know, it could be parts of all sorts of different things. How, how do you um, get people to sort of think up, I guess, and, and come to some sort of consistency about what things are um, parts of? Yeah, I mean that really that comes from uh, just just sort of taking uh, we call we called it plus one minus one just because it's a very simple idea, but it just comes from whatever level that you're at, whatever level that you're thinking at, or for example, whatever level you literally are at as a taskmaster in an organization, or you know the level that you're working at. Just think of well, what am I a part of, and what's a part of. Of, of this task, right? Mm -hmm. So if I'm working on something or I, I have some to-do item and I think, okay, like how does this fit into the larger picture and what are the parts of this thing? Mm -hmm. And if you if you get in the habit of just doing plus one, minus one, would, you know, one, go one up and one down, kind of like these circles show, like if you're the middle circle, mm -hmm. just think about what are the parts and what is the whole, Mm -hmm. um, that's a that's a really easy way to just get in the habit of beginning the process of part whole. Of course, you could go plus five minus five or plus n minus n, but but plus one minus one gets people kind of like you know that are new to it in in this in the practice of it. Mm -hmm. It seems like it, it's also important to do the peers, right? So if you're doing plus one minus one, if you if you take your plus one and then look at who else is next to you, like next to my bicycle is a car or something like that. So now it's transportation yeah. uh, or it's another metal, you know, it's a blender because it's metal things or something like that uh, seems important as well. I also think we have to pay attention to, we have a, a very, in my opinion, a clear leaning towards being able to deconstruct stuff into parts mm -hmm. and not consider the, the up level, you know, going up mm -hmm. a level. We find that in, in schools and corporations and everywhere that we're really trained to deconstruct, 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 but not mm -hmm. go away. So yeah. just questioning that I think is important too. Very cool. Um, I want to be super sensitive to folks' time. It's 10.15, which is our scheduled time, um, but we're totally happy to, to you know, hang out and, and talk about another few uh, questions and go a little bit longer if folks would like to stay. Uh, but if you need to leave, totally understand. Ryan already dropped out for uh, nap time. So uh, mm -hmm. uh, welcome to, uh, to stay on. But um, I think uh, Linda just posted, which is great, you know, like showing kind of visuals really helps with this as well, like the iceberg model and, and things like that are, are really useful to kind of give context to what's around um, the thing that you're thinking about. So um, I think that's a that's a great point as well. Um, are there any, uh, you know, one of the keys to this these discussions is to apply this to our own consulting and our own, you know, work. Are there any Thing specifically guidance you would give to us, either training folks we're working with or, you know, ways to approach projects or things like that, that you think would be um, super useful and that we should be focused on? Yes. Okay. <laughs> what, what are they? Well, oh, you go ahead. Go first. Yeah, yeah. So for me, I, I mean, I would say what we fail to do is challenge the way things are pre-organized for ourselves, for, for, for us. And so when we're talking with people, 
they often have things organized in a certain way and they don't actually know why or they can't articulate why. And so then the question is, well, then why would we accept that on its face that that's how it should be? So I would say for me, the, the shortcoming in, in part whole is challenging and looking for alternative ways to actually organize the groupings. Because when you change the groupings, the entire meaning of it can change. And so that's to me a very practical way you know, for example, when we're working with a business, I'm like, well, why are these three things together? Mm -hmm. Have they just always been together? Or is there a real rationale for why they're together? Or There's students in a textbook, you know, textbooks are always organizing things for you. And students should question that organization <laughs> scheme, right? They should say, is that is that just the way these folks that wrote the book organized it? Or is that the way it's fundamentally organized in, in the real world? Are there different ways we could organize it that are equally interesting or perspective giving, that type of thing. And along those lines, my, my father actually had a technique that he would use on us kids. We had a bunch of kids in our family and uh, he did it with like distinctions and systems and things like that. But he would, he would purposefully get it wrong mm -hmm. because kids love to, you know, get it right. Right. So he would be like for distinctions, if I had a dinosaur on my shirt or something, he'd go, Oh, that's a that's a rabbit, isn't it? And and you go, no, 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 that's a distinction, or that's a that's a dinosaur. And then he would he would group things like the wrong way, mm -hmm. and and then kid would be like, oh, no, that's not how they're grouped. They're grouped like this, you know. So he would kind of be the bumbling, you know, uh, silly kind of thing. But I would also say just have fun with part whole. I think you cannot. People always want to be like, am I doing this right? Is, is this correct? I don't know what to do. And if if you can just get people, A, to understand that part whole is always operating, right? That That's the awareness part. And the research clearly shows that that awareness is going to make a big change. And then B, just play around. Yeah. Like you can, you can combine crazy things together and make a part whole system and it's interesting and 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 that will get your brain practicing that fluidity and that flexibility it's almost like stretching you know like just try weird positions and it'll it'll stretch your brain to be very fluid with part whole and that goes for all the different patterns but that's something I recommend a lot for for mapping is to map something totally different. Like people that you know talk about the kitchen, you got the sink and the refrigerator or whatever, but you could map like where do you stand most often? Yeah. Or what's the most expensive thing? Or you know, where is the temperature different or things like that? And just try to take something that's very common that you think of and just come at a totally different angle to and it. And along the, along those lines, Matt, I mean, the most advanced kitchen designers in the world. That's what they're doing because yeah. they're saying, how could I design a kitchen better than the way it's designed right now? How, mm -hmm. how could I think about a kitchen in such a different way that I might actually organize the parts differently than we've always done it? Yeah. And then they, they discover new ways to, you know, work in the kitchen or, or, you know, so that's what the high at the highest level. That's what those are the kinds of things that elite kitchen designers are doing. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> For sure. Very cool. Well, good. Um, maybe last word, Scott, you have a quick one, and then I think we should wrap up. Yeah, I think it's it's on point with this. Um, so I had mentioned earlier about using the saying, oh, part, that's part of this. Actually using the, the word part in a conversation right. with someone, kind of, I can see their eyes change. And I'm, I'm just wondering, because of these results, which I hadn't heard before, this idea of asking someone, huh, so what are your parts of that, which I think, Matt, you had said earlier, is based on these results is probably going to give you every time a different part whole grouping than the one you're thinking of. Yes. So if you can just be open to that and say, hey, so what are, what are the parts of that? And just see what comes out, because it's probably going to surprise you. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of the single most important questions I ask. I, I don't use, say what I, I, I say, what's that made up of? Mm -hmm. And so when I say, when you say X, what's that made up of? And they go, oh, well, it's this and that and the other thing. And then I'm like, oh, okay, that's, that's different than what I was thinking they meant, you know, and all of a sudden you have a much better idea of what the distinction that they're making.
Very cool. Well, uh, I want to be uh, thank everybody for for staying on. This was a, a great discussion. Again, it's, it's it's so fascinating to me because it's such a simple idea, but it is so powerful. Like you started out saying, Derek, it's uh, and you can really spend uh, a lot of interesting time sort of going up and down in the systems, both on fun topics and and uh, tough challenges. So, thank you again for your time. Uh, thanks everybody for for joining. I know we'll have a lot more viewers uh, on the recording as well. So um, we'll have that posted probably in uh, within a week or so. And uh, don't forget to sign up for the next session, which is on the, I believe, 29th of November. So uh, thanks again. Have a good day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. And then there was two.